buddy. <laughs> For another exciting episode. Yep. Beers and Bites, Season 3. Can't believe it, we made it already to Season 3. Here we are, Episode 1, uh, with our special guest, Paul Valente, who is the CEO and co-founder of... He Search Rockets. I knew that, I promise. So, uh, so hi, I'm Paul, CEO and co-founder of ISO Trust. Really excited to be here on Beers and Bites today. And uh, prior to founding ISO Trust, I've been the CISO at several organizations. Um, I was the CISO at Restoration Hardware, Lending Club, ASAP, and spent decades on third-party cyber risk management. Um, uh, ISO Trust uh, was founded in 2020 uh, after starting to work uh, on thought leadership and prototyping and, and patenting and research in this space since 2017 with my co-founder, Russ Sherman, uh, to transform TPRM and digital trust uh, with AI. And anyway, delighted to to be here with you today. Appreciate it. Great to meet you. Um, guess I'll go next. Uh, Jeremy Murdershaw, the, uh, it's one of the co-founders and the CEO and CISO for Fortify, 24 by 7 Managed security services provider, MDR, XDR services, baby. Damn, I can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm Chris Jordan, CEO, a co founder of Fluency Security. We're a data analytics company that does security. Uh, mostly the work we do is uh, SIMs, as people know what a SIM is. And, uh, yeah, that's all we do. So it's exciting. We're going to be releasing a new product in a couple months, and we'll cover it uh, probably in a future episode. All right. So as is our tradition, we're going to talk about our beers or our our beverages, depending on your mood today. Paul, let's start off with you. What did you bring? So I brought an Don Golden from Athletic Brewing. Here's the here's the can here. Nice. And then I've got here's Here's the uh, the actual the results. So cheers, cheers, Chris. What do you have today? You know, I got it. I like Vassin. You know, I've been hitting the Vassin. This, yeah, Festa. No Vassin. When I bought it, the guy goes, "You know, this is a top five beer in the world." I'm like, "Damn!" Now they're down in Charlotte, uh, Charlottesville, I should say, uh, Virginia, and uh, it's, it, it, it's excellent beer. It's Jeremy. It's like go to top Norway with the Vassin. Wow. Yeah, they normally go for the uh, the um, they have a, a, a what do you call that a Hesselweizen. So Hesselweizen. this is my first time. Yeah, this is my first time trying this one. But solid beer. It's a hard one to get though. I, I I have to go to like boutique kind of uh, wine shops that have a beer fridge. And unfortunately, this guy's fridge is like dead. So mm -hmm. because the fridge doesn't work, he gave me a two dollar discount. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, it's become my favorite place. I, I really hope that refrigerator <laughs> keeps broken. <laughs> and I also hope your beer is not skunky because of that. Mm. Oh, no, no. Actually, you know, it was still being delivered when I got there. I'm like... Fresh off the boat. Oh, my God. It's so should have something like a drop notice. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I got a uh, Goose Island Beer Company. I got the Neon Beer Hug. Wow. It's a little bear... Tall boy, it's got 10,000 volts. 10,000 volts. We'll see if it tastes good or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, cheers, fellas. Cheers. Let's, uh, cheers. Cheers. Let's talk some tech. Let's talk tech. So, tell us about yourself, Paul. So, um, so about myself. So, I've been a technologist for a long time. I actually uh, started working with computers as a job. Kind of serendipitously as a as a kid, really, it just kind of just kind of happened. And my first um, you know real kind of enterprise security experience came working for city government. That's where I my first job after kind of transitioning from uh, from several years of consulting and working with small businesses was uh, essentially doing network administration uh, for city government. And uh, and this was uh, I guess the late late nineties. And so I was doing things like putting some of the first computers and police cars and, and working on early, uh, multi metropolitan area networks. So really early wireless that was horribly unreliable, um, and things like that. And, uh, also got a chance to, you know, work on firewalls and dispatch computers and crime computers, things like that. And that's really where I got an interest in security. I, uh, I went from there to, 
uh, teaching at night and weekends, uh, college courses in, uh, in security, uh, just because there was such a, a shortage of expertise. They would hire people without degrees like myself who actually left school to teach school. Um, and, uh, and then after that, I moved into financial services and spent, uh, the majority of my career since then in the private sector, um, uh, at companies, uh, like I worked for a while at a, at a, a bank of America subsidiary. I worked at lending club for a long time, uh, also at technology companies too. And, um, and, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the intro, you know, spent a lot of time dealing with third party cyber management. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that more later, but, but obviously that's been a passion of mine for, for quite some time and, and ultimately, uh, got me and my co-founder into founding vice of trust outside of that. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a father. I've got three boys like it or not. They're wonderful, of course. Um, but a little more diversity would have been great. Um, and, uh, and they, they range in ages. So I've got a five-year-old all the way up to a 14 year old. Um, so, uh, so, so that's a, that's a delight of mine. And um, other than that, I like to play music. I'm a, I'm a guitarist as well. So that's me. Yeah. Nice. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. We're excited um, to have you as our first guest here in season three. So kicking it off. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to yeah. be here with you, Jeremy and Chris. Awesome. So what is Viso Trust? And is it Viso, Viso? What's the, what's the problem? This Chris and is rhyme with CISO is it supposed to be viso so we say viso oh um we hear we hear we hear everything though viso 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 um viso uh what we don't like to hear is visio it's definitely not <laughs> visio the other ones are kind of permissible and and of course as we like to say paying customers can pronounce it however they like right um in any case um yeah we say viso and uh viso is a SaaS platform that essentially allows companies to assess third parties uh, in minutes using a suite of AI-based tools uh, much more accurately um, than they ever could prior in a much more scalable way. Um, and uh, yeah, it's also a digital trust platform as of recently as well, allowing companies to respond to trust queries uh, in a highly automated way as well using AI. So what makes it different or what is your differentiator in the market space? You got it's kind of becoming a crowded space now. You've got big players like Vanta coming in who kind of offer that full end-to-end -end service. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so third-party cyber risk management in particular has been fairly stagnant for the last twenty years. Really, when I when I first started working in the space, um, I was working for a uh, what we called then an application service provider, a company that was selling essentially what we now call a SaaS model, corporate social responsibility solutions to Fortune 1000 companies, essentially 250 of the Fortune 1000, the largest companies in the world. And for each of those, we had to undergo an assessment, right, from a security or risk standpoint. And, you know, back then, companies were really averse to the idea of sending data outside of their their uh, their four walls, right? Um, Salesforce was kind of the pioneer in SaaS, and they were still only working with small companies back then. They, they weren't an enterprise play yet. And, uh, and so I would receive 3,000 question questionnaires, you know, from, from companies. And I was faced with the problem of, okay, do I hire another security person to help make our security program more robust? Or do I hire another security person to answer questionnaires, right? And I, I had to do the latter at that time. Now, of course, we, we built a great program in, in whatever way we could. But, but, um, but for the past 20 years, there's been essentially two ways with some kind of mod minor modifiers to assess third parties. You could send them a questionnaire, which is what I just described, right? Which there's lots of problems with that today. More than 50% of companies won't respond to questionnaires. So you're going to have great, great gaps in your visibility just from that. And then the second uh, major problem is that questionnaires are highly biased, right? Uh, you never know who's filling out that questionnaire. More often than not, it's a, a sales a salesperson or a, a BDR, a junior salesperson, right? 
who's essentially saying, hey, boss, what I need to say to, to for us to get the deal here, right? Um, yes, 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 or whatever that might be. Rarely is it somebody highly qualified and never is it somebody objective from a, from a bias standpoint, right? Because they're obviously highly incentivized to give positive responses. The third and final issue with questionnaires is that they're labor intensive and slow. They have to be triaged. There's lots of back and forth clarification. Oh, they said no, but they didn't fill in the comments. Or the the answer says yes, but the comments say no, right? There's lots of interpretation analysis. It's very painful on both sides, right? The second thing that essentially came to be because questionnaires are so problematic is security ratings. I'm sure both of you guys are familiar with security scorecard and our listeners, of course, security scorecard, BitSight, um, you know, many, there's probably 20 of those companies now, um, companies like Black Kite, Panda Rays, UpGar, there's, there's new ones every day, right? And they're all essentially using various flavors of open source intelligence to try and garner some idea outside in of companies' security posture. Now, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that they are based on what's, what you can attribute publicly to companies, which is their public-facing marketing websites. By and large, the majority of companies, especially B2B companies that you want to assess, their website is not connected to their production infrastructure. It's not connected to their corporate infrastructure. In fact, it's not connected to anything that's relevant to the real security posture of that company. Yep. Right. And, uh, and so the data is of highly limited usefulness. Now, the good news for those companies and their customers is that you can pull up something on any company immediately, right? You don't have to go through the work of doing a TPR and assessment, right? Um, so if you're in a, in a world where, where uh, from a compliance standpoint, something is better than nothing, well, that's the appeal of those tools, right? I can pull something and say, hey, I did something. I sent them a note that said their score was bad. You know, check the box, right? I, I did something, right? And so that's really the problem we solve. I, I know that you mentioned like the Dratas and the Vantas of the world. And for, for us, those are actually one of many different data sources. So those companies do automated compliance, allowing companies to automate their process of getting a SOC 2 or getting an ISO or a high trust and of documenting their program and collecting evidence, right? Making that faster, more efficient, sometimes cheaper. Um, and, uh, and putting them in a position to try and demonstrate trust, right? Maybe with a trust page. And so the portals that those companies provide, the APIs that they provide, the reports that they provide, the data they provide is all one of many data sources for us, where for us getting to our unique differentiator is a unique technology that's patented since 2017 called Artifact Intelligence, which is an AI-based uh, set of tools that allow us to assess any company using artifacts of their security program that already exist. Those artifacts range from security policies and standards to pen tests, to SOC reports, to vulnerability scans, to uh, trust portals, to, uh, to public information, whatever is available, um, to allow us to uh, analyze those artifacts, determine their assurance levels, extract all relevant control information, and populate a very robust standards-based risk assessment that references over 25 different frameworks um, with really only five minutes required of time, you know, uh, of the user. It's um, highly automated. So that's essentially what's different about us is artifact intelligence and the ability to use AI to assess companies based on real evidence and artifacts of the security program that already exists. Five minutes? I mean, that's... Five minutes, that yeah. That is a, a, a CIO's or CISO's dream, if you can demonstrate that. You how, bet. How is that You work? bet. Yeah, so you pick a company from a directory of over two and a half million, and even if it's not in there, it takes you 30 seconds to create. You, you're then essentially, uh, you're then given a very simple in interface for defining what we call the business context. So third-party risk management and inherent risk in particular is not one size fits all. Right, Different companies are going to be using different products and services from the same company. They're going to be sharing different data, right? That's all going to mean different context, different risk. But in our system, which it makes this super easy and super user-friendly, 
you configure the business case, which is the unique way that we're working together. It's just a couple of clicks, but in the background, the system actually models based on NIST 800-30 and NIST 800-53, over 8,000 different data points to uniquely determine the attack surface of that relationship. Therefore, the likelihood and the risk model of breach and also dynamically the controls that would be in scope for residual risk assessment. It then prompts you for the data that's in, that is, uh, could be impacted, that's in scope uh, for this relationship, right? And for that, we've built a taxonomy of data types that works across industry vertical uh, based on a deep study of the cost of breach. And it takes into account various data privacy regulations from across the globe, various types of industry-specific regulations on data. Uh, again, it's also very simple and, and completely customizable, but very few customers do. It's very valuable out of the box. That allows us to model the impact of breach based on data, right? So that immediately gives you an inherent risk score. That's like, this is what I just described is like 30 seconds on the platform, uh, literally. And then in a couple more clicks, you can kick off an assessment. There's a couple ways that uh, an assessment can be done. It's flexible because you've got different use cases with different vendors. But the most common and what's typically the most labor intensive prior to ISO is end entering a third party contact, perhaps the, the sales rep, right? Um, and clicking start assessment, which in, in invites them to the platform and collects uh, information from them um, that augments what we've collected publicly and typically only takes them about five to 10 minutes. But after that click, I'm done in terms of being on the print practitioner side after I click that start assessment button. Now, for companies where you're dealing with like a portal like AWS, you can just drag and drop artifacts from the portal. We give you guidance on what artifacts we look for and you'll, they'll be instantly assessed. Obviously, the platform has seen all those artifacts you know, a bazillion times already from other customers as well. Um, but in any case, um, in terms of that vendor vendor experience, it's also the easiest, simplest, most streamlined approach for vendors. In fact, we get like love letters from vendors on the platform that have said, oh, I've been on every different platform. I've been assessed every which way. And this was the easiest ever. And why? It's because they're brought into a web-based adaptive flow that uh, essentially asks them for whatever artifacts they have in their program right? Which is going to vary depending on the maturity of their program, right? Also what we need is going to vary depending on that business case, and what controls are in scope too, right? Um, but, um, but it's an adaptive flow that's purpose-built to allow us to assess any company regardless of size, industry vertical, um, region, even, even language. Um, we, many of our customers have a global footprint. So, uh, so the platform su supports a wide variety of standards and languages. In any case, they'll be prompted to that adaptive flow to provide artifacts um, and evidence of the security program, the same things you would use to measure and monitor and, and create and evidence your own security program. Um, the platform consumes those artifact intelligence runs um, and uh, produces the assessment. Sounds pretty amazing. You know, for folks that have that um, you know that have been doing this the way we all did it for the last 20 years, um, it really is. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a new paradigm uh, and a completely new way um, that, uh, that solves the two things that I saw as the major issues in this space. One, data quality. How do we get good quality data that is not only like, do you say you have controls in place, but gives us a real measure of the assurance of those controls, right? And then the second thing is, um, is scale right? Um, because companies rely on so many third parties nowadays, in some ways, arguably for many companies, um, you know, cybersecurity, third party security is turning into all of cybersecurity because their technology footprint is nearing hundred percent third party. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can't just, you can't hire a bazillion analysts and, and really the last thing you want to do is put your, your best security architects on TPRM, right? So it has to be highly automated. It has to be fast, it has to be scalable. That, that fast piece is important too, because, because you want to get this data when you're thinking about working with a third party, you don't want to get it like 
when your business owner already invests in six months and, and, you know, building project plans with this company and where you're going to have to torpedo a top line revenue initiative to, to avoid a bad vendor. Right. I mean, last thing you want to do is inject business risk, paint yourself as the department of no, and like, get yourself canned. I mean, that's what happens to CISO. That's the 18 to 24 months, right? Oh, they weren't aligned with the business, with the needs of the business, right? Um, so, you know, we all know that story. And so to be a good business partner, you've got to be like, yeah, bring me the 10 vendors that you're thinking about. And in a couple of days, I'll have back all the security data on all of them. I'll have the recommendations for you and integrate that into your selection process. So no more like, I'm the bad guy. I'm going to throw the brakes on everything. I'm going to like two weeks before you go live, I'm, I'm going to drag you before the risk committee and tell the world that we shouldn't do, we shouldn't move a thousand people to a new call center that's going to save us a hundred million dollars next year. Right. Um, no, cause they're, you know, they're not secure enough. Right. I mean, the business always makes the same decision anyway. Is it, is it, am I going to roll the dice with something that could have a pretty major impact, but might not happen, right? right? Or am I gonna, or am I gonna roll the dice on the business where I'm like definitely not going to make all that money that I was going to make otherwise, right? Well, yeah. that's an easy choice, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the risk and I'm gonna make all the money, right? Yes. Um, they have to make that choice. That's their job as, you know, as 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 revenue bearing executives, right? So, so um, so yeah, it's a it's a very very different way, uh, and and unlocks really a power to have a meaningful TPRM program rather than than just a security theater or check the box sort of program. And for those uninitiated listeners, the acronym TPRM is third party risk management. Yeah. Thank thank you for that. Um and probably for many of our listeners, third party security management, their vendor security, um uh, third party cyber risk management, etc. Yeah. All right, Chris, what's on your yeah. mind, sir? No, nah, 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 let's do let's do the easy ones. Thank God, Paul's drinking. You know, sometimes we do these, and they just the guest doesn't drink. Um, <laughs> that, we find that. I the, mean, uh, I saw the beers and bites. I mean, I did forget the bites, but I mean, <laughs> I had to. I had to bring the beer, right? Well, the bites is the the technology discussion, right? That's yeah. our that's there our ang- that's our uh, our angle there. There we go. That must Man. be the the beer slowing me down a little bit there. Well, that makes the conversation more fun as time goes on. Oh yeah, so oh, yeah, please. All right. So, so one of the easy questions we can ask is, what is third-party risk? Yeah. So third-party when when so companies rely on third parties to do business, right? Uh, by and large, third parties they either make us money or they make us more efficient at making money, right? And today there is a bazillion companies that do everything that we do but better in a much more specialized way. So companies uh, essentially need to take advantage of the core competencies and the innovations of other comp- of other companies in order to stay innovative themselves, right? So if you're, let's say, a CIO or a CTO, one of the most valuable things you do for your company is you find other companies, other products and services and technologies that uh, that are cutting edge in their special way to optimize your business, right? But when you share sensitive data or access with third parties, which you you pretty much have to do with many third parties today in order to take advantage of their products and services, that brings risk, right? It, it increases your attack surface. It, uh, it essentially increases exponentially the number of ways that you could be, uh, your organization could be penetrated by attackers, right? And so, Third-party risk is essentially the process of of uh, ascertaining, measuring the risk of third parties, evaluating that, and using that in your decision-making process with regard to if uh, and indeed how you're going to do business with them. So, you know, you talk about taking a look at the artifacts, which from an assessment point of view, we'd call evidence, right? And the, and the question would be, well, why did you choose third-party and not first party. Why don't you choose say, you know what? I remember being over at Lending Tree and <laughs> I wish someone would just do a quick assessment and give me a hint of what I should be doing. So, I mean, is it that good? Would you say, hey, you know what? If you're too lazy, 
hire us for a first party assessment, right? You take us to look at your own issues instead of somebody else's. That's really an interesting question. And it's actually always been part of the vision and part of the roadmap. And actually today we, we have a number of trust features, which are focused at, at essentially, uh, enabling you to take your own security program and, and kind of bring that to the world, right. To your customers. Right. Now the next kind of a next step there is, is help me build or guide me building my program. And, and our platform kind of naturally does that in a number of ways. Now, from a, a, a pain, you know, kind of threshold um, way that really the pain that, uh, that, that I felt and my co-founder felt was really about the, the security programs of third parties. And, that, and that's really what that pain and having to deal with that is really what, what, what led us to focus on third party cyber management. And it's actually, that is kind of naturally branched out into these other areas, but it's really because where we felt the pain is really what led us to, to focus on that part of the problem. But you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It is the, the technology and the approach is very portable to other areas. And, and today the platform, as you, as you build your trust program and you can answer questionnaires in a completely automated way and uh, using AI on the platform um, through, a, through a technology called IQR, as you build that profile, which is really just uploading materials, the platform gives you guidance and gives you feedback and, and says the program you built is appropriate for this sort of data and these sorts of customers, right? Um, and that's something that we're definitely going to be building on um, in the future. Now, we do see that as distinct from like the Dratas mm -hmm. and the Vantas of the world, which are, they're really focused on um, on on building as many APIs as they can into into different different technologies to gather compliance data, and then automating the evidence ga evidence gathering, packaging that up in the way that folks like EY and Coldfire and KPMG you know want to see when they're doing their assessments, right? And so it's a bit of a different problem, different different animal for us. For for us, we see those um, as valuable data sources, right? But there is, in terms of achieving assurance, it does take something more than than um, than just uh, just gathering data from, let's say, APIs, right? Because there's always that question. So let's say you've you've hooked up to um, to AWS, for instance, to pull information on how you manage authentication, right? There's always that question: Does the scope of that evidence that we just pulled is that the whole story? Right? Is that everything that's relevant, let's say, for the products and services? Right? And that always boils down to some human element and typically some qualified third party. Right? And, and measuring all these things in mass usually needs to be reflected across an industry standard. Folks want to see that across NIST or across ISO or across AICPA or, or, or high trust or, or, or whatever it might be, depending typically on their industry and region. And so, so uh, our approach and kind of where we sit allows us to leverage all those components and um, in order to uh, to really give the 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 best picture that's appropriate for for kind of trade and commerce our our vision is to become the the largest global provider of risk intelligence on the planet but also the de facto standard for business to business transactions so it is really how to use this data to enable business transactions and trust in the most meaningful and accurate way possible. Interesting. All right. So I'll give you the last softball. Dan, you gave us like a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> um, so the last one, like, so your product vision of your company, like where is your, where, where do you think, two things, where do you think your company's going? And, and it coincides with really the bigger questions. Where do you think this industry is going? Because this is an industry that is very fragmented right now. You talked about people spurring off on the, the, the governance sort of, you know, compliance section. Uh, you, you looked at scorecard, you look at all these things. Where is third-party trust going from a technology point of view, from a, from a business point of view? And then where is, I'm just going to go with the CISO one, VISO going <laughs> with, with this type of technology? Yeah, yeah. So where is TPRM going? So TPRM has 
traditionally been, uh, we talked about it being questionnaire based, you know, we've talked a lot about, we've mentioned standards and you know, everybody has their different favorite standard and all those things. Now that stuff is all language, right? Um, and uh, when my co-founder and I started focusing on this problem in 2016 and shared our vision together um, of, you know, automating this, really revolutionizing this space with AI-based technologies, we, that's when we first started, you know, working on this problem. And uh, I mentioned earlier, we filed our first patents in, in 2017. And then we started building prototypes and building models. Um, we went from, we were at Lending Club at the time, we went there to ASAP, uh, which is an entirely AI focused company, right? Um, there we got to work with some of the best AI researchers in the world building tools specifically using AI-based technologies and particularly generative AI uh, and, uh, and a suite of other AI-based uh, technologies. And this allowed us to take a, a really different approach. Now, it, I would say it was actually challenging in 2020 to essentially talk about and market AI-based TPRM. CISOs are highly skeptical individuals in general and highly skeptical, skeptical of AI. And so, you know, so was I, and so am I, uh, you know, with regard to tools. Um, and, you know, the last thing that I needed as a CISO was like an AI based SIM that gave me a thousand alerts at 50% confidence. And I needed, you know, 50 people to like sift through all the garbage to figure out what, what things were meaningful. Right. So, and, uh, you know, for a while we had lots of tools that just touted AI and you'd, you'd check into it and there was really nothing to it. Right. So, so it was a hard story to tell. Um, and we actually, we actually didn't focus that much on it. We focused on automation, right. Um, um, because, uh, you know, an operational efficiency and accuracy, which, which, you know, did wonders. We've, we've built an incredible business with that. But now the world actually knows what generative AI is. And the fact that our platform uses generative AI and specifically a type of generative AI that's highly special, specialized called retrieval augmented generation, which is actually, you know, unlike something like ChatGPT, which we're all familiar with, with generative AI, and which also uses large language models and GPTs, what's different is that the information and responses that all happen in natural language are grounded on information, on a specific data set of information. So, so let's say on our platform, you're assessing a company, we've gathered a body of data and information and artifacts from that company. In the platform, you can actually just ask a question. You can ask any question and you're gonna get an answer and that answer is going to come to you in natural conversational language. And it's going to be accurate, nearly 100% accuracy. And it's going to have references to all the different artifacts that had relevant information, even if the words don't match at all, right? Um, and, uh, and then there's going to be lots of metadata on the assurance levels of those different artifacts and the standards that they're attributed to and, and you know, how old they are and and who created them, all, all sorts of valuable stuff, right? And so as you can see from that example, this concept of sending a thousand questions you know, to a company about their security program is meaningless, right? There's no, there's, it's totally unnecessary now, right? You're, why have the middle person, you know, which is again, a salesperson probably, filtering that information in answering those questions, why not just go right back, right to the data, right? And and why not get all that valuable meta information too? Like, oh, they've got, you know, multi-factor authentication. Here's how it's designed. Here's how it works. Here's the products that they use for it. And by the way, this was this was audited in their in their SOC 2 uh, type 2, right? Um, um, rather than just like they said yes to that line on the questionnaire, right? The, the, the former is way more valuable. Right, right of sure. information, right? So, so, um, so, so, in even as soon as a year from now, CRM is going to be completely different, going to be completely different. Yeah, definitely, um, dominated, you know, by 
by the approach that we're taking. It, it is it is absolutely going to replace um, the painful questionnaire as we've been suffering through for the last 20 years. So, Paul, I have to ask you before I let Jeremy say anything. So what is the top three things that people get screwed on? Like, what is the top three? AI looks at you, went through 853, and you know what? X, Y, and Z are so consistent that I don't even know why I have AI. I mean, what is what is it that everybody's kind of like, every time you do a risk assessment, what's the big big ones that people miss? That's good. Question. Yeah, so um, that is a great question. And uh, and the answer is is probably going to be a little disappointing for you, but I'll but I'll give some interesting <laughs> ones too. Okay. The um the so so the first thing that is this concept of assurance, right? Um, now if all you can do is tell me I have these controls in place, that's not a ton of assurance. And if I'm a I'm a big bank that's about to share you know half the country's social security numbers with you, well. That's probably not enough assurance, right? Um, and so, so you sh you get assurance from qualified third parties using relevant standards, um, and you know, digging deep um, into your program. So that's one thing that comes up, you know, fairly frequently. The next thing is uh, is controls that are not uh, that are, that aren't always covered in standardized audits and assessments, right? And um, and the, this is where you know it's going to kind of it's going to kind of bore you a little bit because I'm sure you, you folks know this, but but um, but uh, ubiquitous and quality multi-factor authentication, right? Um, uh, in uh, meaningful um, encryption at rest, um, uh, really effective incident response, and uh, lastly, but certainly not least. Um, effective software development life cycle, right? These these things that I mentioned, um, um, especially the last two, um, are much easier said than done, right? And so so these things come up frequently, right? They're 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 challenging not only for companies but for the industry, and and so they they do come up for sure. What would you say are the if you had to give advice to that future CISO or that aspiring CISO out there, um, what would you say to them? You know, uh, kids graduating from college, they've, they have come out with their CISSP, maybe they've got a CISM, or they got some alphabet soup, you know, certs that they've picked up along the way. Make it a CISO. <laughs> but yeah, it's, they, oh, I'm, I've got all these certifications. I am so smart now, right? We both, all of us, all three of us have cut our teeth in the industry, right? So we kind of deserve to be where we are because of the, the, the hills that we've had old. to climb and we're old. Well, mm -hmm. speaking for myself and Chris, um, <laughs> but what is the advice that you would give to somebody who wants to be a CISO and, and what, how what, what would you say their career path should look like? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's two kind of, um, blocking and tackling things. That, that I'll mention, and then I'll mention um, a, a little bit, a little bit more on the kind of the business strategy side. But the blocking and tackling is, uh, you know, I feel like it's really important as the CISO to be to have as much of an understanding of application security and software security as you possibly can. I really see it as you know where the rubber meets the road, um, and um, and so. Uh, and so I see that as really, really important, and just something that um, that you need to continually be investing in your in your own expertise and the expertise of your team on. Uh, obviously, even more if you're at a company that is is actively developing software, which most are to some degree somewhere, right? Um, the next one is with regard to incident response. Um, you know, and I'm sure probably resonates with with you all, um, given the space that that you're in. Um, but that incident response, how do you know how well you're doing and whether any of it means anything at all, right? And incident response is not easy. Um, uh, making sure that you are generating every type of log file, making sure that it's all going to the right place, making sure, uh, you know, I mean, and that means dealing with a ton of people that really don't want that to, to help you make that happen, right? Um, and then um, ensuring that um, 
uh, that, you know, everything you could possibly know about your environment and about the assets in your environment um, is just incredibly critical and it's an incredibly critical exercise. And uh, and doing that um, is so important. I, I accidentally reused the, used the metaphor already, rubber meets the road, but I, but, uh, but threat and incident response engineering tire, that's what I called it, um, <laughs> you know, at, uh, at lending club. So I, I literally refer to it as where the rubber meets the road. I really do believe that. And so, um, so that's kind of the second thing your company has to be doing that has to be good at it. It's always hard because it's not, it seems like nothing but a cost center to the business and it's expensive. Um, and, um, but, but you just have to do it. Otherwise you're not really doing anything. You're just kind of pretending. Um, then, uh, now going out of that into like the business of being a CISO and being successful, um, you are a business leader you Need to understand the business. You need to help the business make business decisions. That means you've got to be a great business partner partner. It means, it means that you're not the department of no, it means you're the depart department of Yes, and this is what the consequences will be, and this is, and this is what we have to do if we want to do that, right? Um, and uh, and you have to understand business risk. You have to understand, you know, what it means to to not make the money, to not be successful, to add friction to the to the business process, right? Um, you need to understand those things so you can have mm -hmm. meaningful conversations with business stakeholders. And so, you know, that's one of the things that's been so rewarding with Viso and uh, it was in some ways unexpected. You know, um, I remember when it came up with uh, our first or second customer, which is they're, they're part of GM, Cruise Automation, the the um, the uh, self-driving car div division of GM. They'd actually stood up a few different teams um, that uh, that essentially failed, that, that ultimately turned over um, in running third-party cyber management. They tried four different platforms and they eventually received a vote of no confidence and were bypassed in the in the procurement process by the business because they couldn't give kind of um, actionable or consistent results. They couldn't do it in a timely way. They were slowing everybody down. That's when they came to us and you know rolled the dice on a new company with a with a new approach. And in the first couple of months, we had eliminated their entire backlog. We were really excited. Um, you know, we approached them, uh, said, Hey, can we interview you guys, see how it's going? And what we heard was that we had essentially reinvented their security team and that this being such a visible process, they essentially got feedback of, from other departments and other teams of like, wow, we need to up our game and that they were the model for innovation and efficiency to which other teams aspired. And obviously, I mean, there, that's they, my praise were, right there right i mean they here they were enjoying the the thing you know, that as practitioners my co-founder and i had wished we'd had which was really why we why we built the company so enormously um uh you know fulfilling and 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 so that's you know that's why we do it that's we're trying to we're trying to create that experience for for uh for every every CISO and every security team out there very interesting it's it, aspirational right to go from being or inspirational even to be, go from being you know entry just getting into computing as a young person and then having a, a career where you get to leapfrog through the information security industry uh, eventually landing as CISO multiple times and now as a founder and a and a, a CEO of a, of a cyber company I mean that's and it should be everybody. I've been dream. very fortunate. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been, it should be everybody's dream. At least all the computer science nerds out there listening to us, <laughs> right? <laughs> Security and application development. Those are the two places you want to go. Well, wow. Well, you, you said it. I mean, I, and I've just been so fortunate to be at a time where there's just been so much digital transformation where you might hire one company to do one thing you know, 10 years ago or something, you know, now you might hire 20 companies doing all specialized little things. Right. And, and We're so saying, it's going to be an AI bot that's going to do it for you. <laughs> and now that's a whole nother level of third party risk assessment that we have to figure out how to do. Yeah. With. Yeah. 
Yeah, you got it. That's a very interesting scenario. And it, it, it plays into um, some of the things that we do with fourth party, because we actually do a lot of work with fourth party and nth party risk at this okay. point too. Okay. But but we'll have to get into a bond chose say, by vendor risk. There you go. How does, how, so how do you describe, so first party means yourself, third party means your immediate vendor. What is fourth party referring to? Yeah, so fourth party is their vendors. Um, and then end party is their vendors, vendors on, on, and so on and so forth. Right? The, supply and, um, the supply chain. I'm, I'm my old grandpa. Yeah. Eventually they're going <laughs> to yeah. use you and you're going to go, Oh my God, we're the lead. We, you know, we're the problem. <laughs> so we're the customer yeah. and the problem. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it, in, uh, interestingly, similarly, similarly to how a SIM is joining information on so many different data sources and. Uh, and with the metaphor you've depicted in your background there, Chris, similarly, yeah. you're looking at third parties in the same way, right? This ecosystem of third parties and where your data is traversing various links um, with various degrees of connection, similar to something like LinkedIn, um, is uh, our platform as a feature that we call a risk network, where we mine from both public sources and from artifacts, um, products and services, and upstream and downstream uh, relationships between companies, allowing companies to monitor not only their third parties, but also their end parties, if you will. Hey, hey Jeremy, um, I was thinking about coding a, a new website called Geek Out instead of LinkedIn. And and it's for people that just want to have a talk without all the marketing, where you can like actually do something. And you just boot them when they start doing the marketing crap. Yeah. You know, I used to, know. They also used to be called chat boards, right? Or I, I, I was going to say channels. PBSs. PBSs, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking of I was thinking of that today when somebody brought something up and I go, man, this reminds me of the PBS days. Um, no, you know, Paul, it's, it's excellent. It was like, I don't want to keep on going because we'll go for hours. We have before and it's not a good thing. Um, <laughs> no, no. Um, well, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I've got like a whole sheet of other stuff, but uh, I think, um, who knows, maybe we'll, we'll drink some more and, and do some more stuff after that. I mean, Jeremy, two. yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated. First of all, I think, you know, the, the language approach is excellent. I, I think there's a very interesting approach to this problem because to tell you the truth, like you brought up Vanta, well, Jeremy brought up Vanta. I think Vanta is SOC 2 compliance, which is a little bit different than third-party risk. And, and right. maybe, we, you know, if, if you want to say what's the difference, cool, it's not, all right. Um, but overall, I think this is a very fascinating idea that you, you've got. It's... Uh, is it going well? You guys are doing good? It's going great. It's growing great. We are bringing on new customers as fast as we possibly can. We, we've we got customers with many thousands of third parties on the platform. Uh, across our customers, they've been able to cover 98.4% of their third parties. So for the first time, giving companies the ability to gain complete visibility into their entire program. That one uh, for some of them, that six. means actually reducing the risk by ninety five percent because they had they lacked so much visibility before. Um, so, uh, but, uh, when Jeremy, is, when is, Paul, just out of curiosity, so yeah. what is the risk of Microsoft as a third party <laughs> <laughs> or Google? That's funny, you know. I, I somebody came to me and and actually a customer um, that, uh, that actually before they came a customer, they were using one of the ratings vendors, and they told me they said Microsoft has a has a D right um on this ratings vendors platform um and they were like could microsoft security really be that bad and oh my god explain i was like they've that's measuring their website their website is supporting ciphers since the beginning of time because they support ie stone age whatever that version is <laughs> that's and it's just marketing data they don't care right how um, much how much spam do you get with microsoft email i will tell you that is the evidence or the artifacts of, of the type of third party you're dealing. Though, I, you know, Jeremy, I, I, I don't know if you saw the recent Apple release of the operating system. They now have a feature to share your password with others, which means that not only forget the EULA, bypassing Netflix and a crap like that, but now it's opposite of FISMA. FISMA requires one user ID to be logged in, and Microsoft has now allowed you to share your ID with anybody. So I don't know how Microsoft is FISMA compliant, but that's a different story. Convenience well, and security. 
battling it out. It's the it's the consumer versus the business, though. I think that's the friction there. You have the consumers who want a platform that's super easy to use that they can yeah. they share with their friends, their 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 grandparents, their children. I share. And we go to a, my kids come over or their friends come over. They share the Wi-Fi password to the guest network through their iPhone. I'm okay right. with that because they're not actually sharing the actual password, right? They're it's basically like a trust. They're granting trust to the Wi-Fi through this this no. Uh, no, Jeremy, I'm hearing you're really bad and party risk to these companies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have some uh, some lightning round questions for you, Paul. Oh, we do. Sure. Okay. There we yeah. go. Ready? Yeah. These are these should be uh, near single word answers. Okay. Favorite sport? Basketball. Why is it not hockey? Oh yeah, that's that's, that's my co-founder's favorite sport, and I have to have a different one. Good answer. <laughs> Favorite basketball team? Uh, the Warriors. Do you think they'll win the championship again? Ever? point i don't know when though 2022 <laughs> 20 or 22 22 yeah they're in the rebuild phase uh, yes yeah, they're in the it, rebuild phase is steph curry a first ballot hall of famer yeah. Ooh, hesitation that sounds like a trick question i'm gonna say yes uh why why what, what what's the what's the uh subtext i there? just don't I, I i don't have enough depth to know like what the what the rules are what even what first ballot means so uh first time they're up they're eligible to be uh voted into the hall of fame they they are oh, okay yeah okay okay he is paul first answer was correct yes <laughs> he, he, he invented just like on standardized tests no he did not invent his correct right his dad invented the three-point shot uh Dale, sorry that's true but his son perfected it yeah yeah but virginia tech owns that that um for you know paul Favorite guitar brand? Ooh, that's a great one. You know, I'm gonna say none. Ooh, no, what's your I'm daily not player? as happy as any of my guitars as I should be. No, oh. what's your daily like, player? Is that next question, Jeremy? What's your daily player? What do you play daily? Or what is the thing that you pick up and use the most? Uh, oh, the thing that I use the most is actually custom, custom built uh, by my by yours truly. Yeah, I was so I close. Twenty years ago, it's a the Strat. I was going to say custom 24. So I got my oh, PRS. Beautiful. Yeah, I got my PRS custom 24 down here. I got my modern Eagle. I would be a PRS fan, PRS fan, but. You know, and maybe if I had one, maybe that would be the one. <laughs> if, as long as you didn't say Ibanez, I, that would be the correct answer. Not Ibanez. Um, <laughs> Anything <laughs> fits. Lead guitarist, Paul. Lead guitarist. Favorite lead guitarist? Mm. Now, Paul they Amory. didn't have a rhythm guitarist, so. I mean, yeah. he he really he really invented double hammering, where where you you hammer with two hands. Um, you know, I would go. With, I hate to say it because I'm a big Grissom fan, but Mark Knopfler is probably my favorite. Oh, I you love know. Mark Knopfler. And then uh, you, you, there's there's the outskirts on the PRS world. There's uh, Davy Knowles, which is an out, he was a really outlier, and Mark Grissom. But but you know, and you know what yeah. he's really good is, but he's a very good songwriter. Stink. I mean, a Sting is crazy. He's really good, too. It's amazing, huh? He that, just that has, guy's talent's just like... Oh, my God. He has charge. hands the size of, of Andre the Giant. There, if you ever <laughs> play Every Breath You Take, and you say you can spam that naturally, oh, my God. that Those are big. Yeah, it's, his talent <laughs> is just too unfair. I, I have a hard time thinking about him because it's just it's just so unfair, right, to be yeah. so good at so many things. But you um, know, Yeah, I mean, he... You mentioned Mark Knopfler. That reminded yeah. me of Chet Not Atkins. Looking. That's another... Taurus life that I love yeah. as well. Sweet. Um, yeah. Right. yeah. And then, of course, got to go favorite band. Favorite band. Um, my favorite band is uh, actually King Crimson. Oh, metal? Wow. <laughs> that, that was unexpected. <laughs> so how long have you been a metalhead? <laughs> so, uh, so I've liked metal among lots of other things. Gosh. Uh, since I was really, since I, since I, since metal existed, I guess, which has got to be like, it's, I guess, somewhere. You know, uh, Jeremy, you know, this yeah. is really scary, but do you know who the other guitarist that we interviewed was, was uh, Dave Mayberry, who is also a heavy metal guitar player. <laughs> and by the way, he worked for uh, Security Scorecard. 
<laughs> that is wow. Is there something is... about metal and TPRM? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there's another. Yeah, I, I need to open up a, another. Even even the big cans, you run out of them eventually. Eventually, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Paul, I, I appreciate it. You know, our lightning rounds were very very tense. Um, Jeremy, anything else, man? Are you done? Yeah, I'm good. Man. I just wanted to say thank you. Actually, I do have one question. One final okay. question before we, we, we let our guests leave. Yeah. If I want to work with Viso Trust and I want to become a user of your platform, can you give me a little bit of an idea of what kind of, what am I looking at at price? If it's too proprietary, we understand, but kind of give us a sense for what it's like, you know, how long is the onboarding? What does that workflow look like? Yeah. Yeah. Great questions. We actually just released last week, or maybe it's two weeks ago now, um, freemium offering, which anybody can come to our website and, it's, it's spicy. Uh, and, uh, and self-register and kick off AI-based assessments. Um, so, uh, we really wanted to democratize, uh, this space and allow people to see how easy and how powerful this technology really is. So, so hopefully that answers your question. Really. It takes, it takes nothing to get started. Nice. And, uh, beyond yeah. that, um, it's essentially, uh, by economies of scale, right? The, the, um, the, uh, the more third parties you're dealing with, the, the less you're going to pay for a third party. Awesome but always a savings over any sort of manual efforts uh, and a huge savings on, uh, on, on risk yeah. ultimately. That's great. Well, Chris, any last questions for you? Any party I'm thoughts? good. I'm good. I'm excited. Actually, this was very good, Paul. I, I, yeah. I think that uh, exciting, a new leaf. I mean, believe it or not, like you brought up like lending tree. I'm like, I've got my money in lending tree. So, you know, you, I always kept on going to your bio. I'm like, man, I, I didn't, I, I've been throwing too much money at you, but yeah, this was uh, no excellent, and and this is uh, a really refreshing way of third party. I have to say that mm -hmm. in the very beginning, I think you nailed on the you know you hit the nail on the head, which is that everybody I know looks at like your profile, and I'll tell you, security support card asking me what type of certificate I'm using my website for my web makes absolutely no you've got security posture. <laughs> Not even in the same world, no. right? And and, and I kind of laugh at those people. So I think you you kind of had me interesting from the very beginning. I think that uh, you have a very refreshing way of looking at third party risk, and I hope that the rest of the industry takes notice and goes that way. Yeah, Jeremy. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, for all of our our listeners out there, you know, take a look at Fiso Trust's website. Sign up for the their freemium model. Get a taste for it. TPM, third party risk management. So much fun. Yeah. Paul, so, Paul, thank you for joining wow. us. Season three, episode one. Thank you for being a part of that. And subscribe. There's a button here, maybe a button here. I don't know. Kingsley is going to put them on there at some point. We'll figure it all out later. Chris and Jeremy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a, it's been a, a, a delight. And thanks to all the listeners. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.